Content warning. This series will discuss topics that may bring up painful experiences for you. Please take the time to surround yourself with good medicines. If need be, pause the playback and go for a walk, stretch, have a glass of water, and come back to the show when you feel comfortable. Welcome to the Métis Speaker Series. I'm your host, Darian Kovacs. On this podcast series, we will be exploring learning, healing, and rebuilding within the Métis community. Our goal is to create awareness of and generate discussion about Métis issues, as well as how to heal from and move forward in a healthy way. We hope to reduce Métis invisibility in BC through the personal stories from our Métis community members. This show is brought to you by Métis Nation BC and Jelly Marketing. Just to get started, Cassidy, do you want to introduce yourself and tell me a bit about uh, what being Métis means to you? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's an honor to be, you know, featured on a podcast back in my home province. And so to the listeners, my name is Cassidy Karen Tanse. Um, my family uh, is Métis. I, I come from the Boucher family from St. Louis, Batoche, or St. Louis, Saskatchewan, and Batoche, Saskatchewan is where my grandfather is from, the Karen side of the family. And uh, I was born and raised in British Columbia. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so I spent four years uh, as an elected official with Métis Nation British Columbia from 2016 to 2020 as the Minister Responsible for Youth. The provincial youth chairperson um, from there have just stayed really connected to the Métis community no matter where I go and uh, just this past September on September 30th I was elected as the Métis National Council president. It's amazing. Now what does that mean to you like uh, you know the role and, the, and that role of leadership? Oh that's a big question. Um, so I feel like leadership is a process and it is a journey. Leadership doesn't have a destination. And I feel like the title leader means something completely different than to embody leadership. And so <clears throat> what I mean by that is that I firmly believe that in order to encompass leadership, you know, an individual has to be open to a continuous journey of learning, evaluating, adapting. And so in this way, I don't think that one person can truly encompass leadership on their own. Um, as an individual, I, I really do believe that it's a collective and a collaborative process that needs to involve as many people and perspectives as possible to be successful. So really, leadership to me is bringing people along and, and opening the doors for more people to uh, contribute and to collaborate. It's amazing. So those that are uh, watching the show, listening to the show, um, maybe really new to the, the Métis world and the Métis community, and maybe they're, they're, they're on their journey to becoming a citizen, and maybe those that have been citizens for a very long time, maybe explain to us kind of like how that kind of structure or ecosystem works when it comes to the leadership and the, 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 the leadership that you're the leader of. Yes. Who, who are you leading? Sure, sounds great. So uh, I'm the president of the Métis National Council, and the National Council is the national body that advocates um, for Métis people uh, at the national and international levels. Um, so a lot of people are really familiar with the Assembly of First Nations, um, which is the national advocacy body for First Nations. We are that, but for Métis people. And so our organization, our, um, our, our body, uh, we represent and, and we work with four provincial Métis bodies, so the Métis Nation British Columbia, Métis Nation Alberta, Métis Nation Saskatchewan, and Métis Nation Ontario. And we've been around since 1983 uh, doing this work and really just being the body that amplifies Métis people's voices at that national level. We go out and we advocate on your behalf um, to get the programs, the services, the recognition that we as Métis people uh, rightfully deserve and, and are owed by the federal government. 
Amazing. So a uh, lot of time in Ottawa, I imagine. Lots of time in Ottawa. Amazing. Yeah. And you were um, one of the chosen people to go and visit the Pope. I was, yes. So um, again, I mean, it was the first week that I I was in Ottawa. I was it was the week after I was elected. Um, we were there. I was meeting with my team for the first time. We had a transition team. It was really exciting. It was uh, nerve wracking. There was a lot happening, and all of a sudden, I get a call from the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, who are the bishops here in Canada. They have a working group established to work with the AFN, the ITK, and the MNC, so the three national Indigenous bodies. Um, and, and can, uh, you say what those, can you explain those acronyms for those? Yes. That so that? the AFN is the Assembly of First Nations, the MNC is the Metis National Council, and the ITK is the Inuit Tapiri Kanatami. And so, yeah, and so we were, we, we got the call saying, we are in the process of sending delegations from these three national Indigenous organizations over to the Vatican to meet with Pope Francis um, to really, at that time, it was a really strong focus on having um, our, our, our organizations go over there and um, really encourage the Pope to come to Canada to make an apology to residential school survivors and their families. Um, and so that was exciting. And so we learned about the opportunity. We went to our governing members, so the, the presidents that uh, I get my mandate from in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, came up with a process to understand who will best represent the Métis Nation as a whole to go over to the Vatican. And we came up with a delegation of eight people and uh, a, just a fantastic group of people to represent the Métis Nation to go over there. Um, and it represents our diversity across the Métis Nation, really highlights and, and lifts up the voices of our Métis uh, residential school survivors and our elders. And, uh, and I'm just so honored to be able to work with all of them. Weeks later, though, we, we got word that uh, the Pope is actually going to be coming to Canada. So we got confirmation that Pope Francis wants to come to Canada within the context of reconciliation. So that has shifted slightly our, um, our purpose for going over to the Vatican. And we're really now focused on bringing the stories of the Métis Nation to Pope Francis so that when he comes to Canada, he understands who we are. He understands our unique experiences, um, our, our survivors' unique experiences with residential school and our, our community's experiences with colonization and intergenerational trauma so that he can come here and, and we, we won't have to brief him while he's here. He can really spend that time in our communities with our people, with our survivors and their families. And so that's the work that we're setting off to do at the end of March. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a really unique experience. It means different things to different people across the Métis Nation. Like I say, the Métis Nation has so much diversity. If you think about the Métis Nation homeland, it's, it's a vast amount of space. And so there's so much diversity. There's so much different and unique experiences. So to some this uh, this visit to the Vatican means a lot. And I think to our survivors who are looking for that apology to to gain that apology and then be able to move on in their healing journeys, it's really important to them. And so I think about those survivors and I think about those stories when I do the work of, of preparing to go over to the Vatican. And that's what I'm carrying with me. And, and I'm, I'm really honored to be able to do that work. Amazing. Um, can you give just like a couple highlights? You, you mentioned the eight and, and representing the, the diversity <clears throat> of our Métis nation across mm -hmm. the country. Maybe, maybe give us a bit about that diversity and, and what does that look like? Yeah. So I, like I say, first and foremost to me, I think it's really important that we highlight the voices of our Métis survivors of residential schools. So we have, uh, we have two survivors who are coming with us. One who attended, um, uh, a, a, a convent in uh, Northwest Territories and she was there and and she has such a powerful story and she's so passionate about wanting to share that story 
but also so passionate that about the importance of sharing the story in order to get to the healing part. So uh, we're, we're bringing her along. She's a really honored elder within the, the Alberta community, um, really the Métis Nation. She, uh, she's an inspiration to me. Um, we have another survivor from the Isle of Cross Residential School, which is in Saskatchewan. And the Isle of Cross Residential School is, you know, it's, it's really unique and it's really important to Métis people to raise awareness about because the Isle of Cross Residential School wasn't actually recognized as a residential school in the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement uh, because it was provincially run. Um, however, that's where most of our Métis people went to. So we need to do that work of finding out those stories. What are those experiences of Métis survivors who went to these schools and didn't get the recognition that they deserve through that process? Um, so two really strong survivors who are coming with us we have somebody who identifies and is very involved in the LGBT2 plus community, 2S plus community, <clears throat> to bring those perspectives, because that's a really interesting one as well, um, to represent, you know, that um, diversity, like I say, within our communities that has been suppressed and has been um, taught by the Catholic Church that it's, it's not right. But before colonization, our, our communities honored these people. And, and we need to go back to ways that our communities functioned pre-colonization. And so it's really important to us to bring that voice to the Vatican. Um, we also have um, somebody coming who has a really strong scientific understanding of the epigenetics of intergenerational trauma. So that is super cool. We're really excited to bring that information you know intergenerational trauma is embedded in our dna it's been scientifically proven that trauma is passed down through generations and it impacts our community so the trauma of residential schools isn't something that happened in the past it's still occurring today and so that's really important to to raise with the catholic church to raise with the vatican and the pope to say this this healing has to still take place into the future um, and then we have some really great community members, community historians who are able to help us tell the stories. And, uh, and we also have uh, an elder coming along who speaks Machif. So he's doing some work um, to be able, well, he's doing tons of work to promote the Machif language across the Métis Nation. And so we're bringing him to show, you know, our culture and our traditions and our language, it's not lost. It, it wasn't fully taken away from us. It's there for us to go back and to reclaim, to pick up. And so that's really important to our communities as well. So I, like I say, when I, I get to spend this time with the delegation that we're bringing over and it's, it's absolutely powerful. They're such an amazing group of people and uh, we're gonna do what we can to, to best represent the Métis Nation and, uh, and find a pathway forward. Um, yeah. It's amazing. Cassie, I want to run an idea, idea by you. So you, you mentioned about, you know, the, the generational trauma, right, passed mm -hmm. on, and it's in within our, you know, bones, are, you know, it's, it's within us, right, and, and, and we carry it with us. Uh, on the flip side, I'm thinking of this delegation of eight people on an airplane, flying and getting some gelato, some ravioli, <laughs> right? And, but, but imagine a <laughs> night where, like, someone pulls out a violin, right, mm -hmm. and, and starts to play this amazing music. And I think there's also on the flip side, and, and I'd love your perspective on this, is, is the connection to the music and the dance of the Métis people. Uh, you're spot on. Absolutely. Um, that was one of the things that we thought on about early on was how do we bring our music into this? And also, how do we bring um, the perspectives of young people into this? And so, you know, next week, I'm going to be meeting with the presidents of each of the youth councils. So um, the, the youth council in BC and, and across the homeland to ensure that the, their perspective is included. But uh, also on top of that, you know, our young people are doing such incredible work in reclaiming our traditions and, and these practices. And we have such talented Métis youth fiddlers. Um, Brianna Lazat. I don't know if, if, if our, the listeners have heard her music, but I will give her a shout out right now. Go check out her music. She is such a talented fiddle player. 
So we, uh, we're going to bring the music of, of our Métis youth fiddle players over there and uh, play it in the background while our elders are doing their prayers um, while we're at the Vatican to, to really highlight the work that our young people are doing in reclaiming these ways and showing the strength of our culture through music as well. And, uh, you know, when the, when the fiddle music plays, people jig. <laughs> and so people could be jigging there, I know. One of the elders and, and survivors who we're bringing over there, she is a passionate jigger. And uh, if she hears that fiddle music, I'm sure she's going to be jigging. So, um, yeah, the, those those cultural practices are so important. And to highlight the strength of our people through these practices while we're over there, I think is going to be really powerful. It's amazing. I, I wonder if, if you went to a Mumford & Sons concert or a Great Big C concert <laughs> And there's all these people who have yet to discover that they're Métis, but then you watch for them at the concert dancing and jigging and realize, all right, there they are. There they are. Let's find <laughs> them. Hey, let's check, check out your background. You might be part of this amazing nation and family. Totally. Anytime I hear fiddle music, you know, I was just on the phone with an elder right before this, and uh, uh, she's just getting over a little bit of sickness. And she said, you know, I'm feeling really good today, though, so good I could get up and do the Red River jig. And I said, well, maybe you should rest a little bit more. I said, maybe you just do that jig in your seat and just sit down and just move your feet. And she goes, oh, I always do. And I find it the same way that, you know, whenever there is fiddle music playing, people are there jigging away in their seats and they'll get up and dance. And yeah, absolutely. It's awesome. So leadership analysis, the, the pre-world um, where you could travel a lot easier, and, and then the post-discovery of Zoom and the efficiency of Zoom, what are your thoughts as, as a national leader? Is there <clears throat> benefits to Zoom, or has there been more like Zoom fatigue that you've been doing? <laughs> I think it's a little bit of both. I think the ability for us to be able to connect just like that through Zoom is fantastic whenever you want to have a visit or um you know you you can't get it through an email to have zoom i think is is so wonderful but it doesn't replace the feeling that you have when you're with people face to face when you're in a room and and visiting it just it doesn't fully replace that and uh you know, I was so excited when I was elected. One of the first things that I want to do, <clears throat> but I haven't been able to, is get out into our communities, spend time with our citizens, spend time with our people to listen to stories and, and be able to share the successes of what's happening in our communities. And uh, COVID has put a stop at that because, of course, we're not traveling right now. We need to keep our community safe. We need to keep our elders and our knowledge keepers safe. Um, so I haven't been able to do that yet. Um, I am holding out hope that uh, we'll get over this soon. And uh, of course, we're, all of our people are getting uh, vaccinated as, as best as possible. And hopefully we can uh, flatten these curves and, and get back out into our community because spending time with people, spending time with people out on the land, um, you can't replace that. You can't do that on Zoom. And um, But I am... I am really grateful for Zoom to be able to have abilities to to visit, uh, you know, wherever you are. It's amazing. Now, I don't want to nurture any sort of like Toronto Maple Leafs, Vancouver Canucks <laughs> vibes, but but do you see a difference in like Métis people who have settled maybe in Ontario versus BC, maybe versus Alberta? Oh, absolutely. Yes and no. I mean, there's so many similarities and there's also so many differences, but you see those differences even within provinces, you know, the landscape from north to south is, is extremely different. Um, what I like to do, you know, I, I used before I was elected, I did a lot of um, like Métis awareness trainings with federal government uh, public servants. And what I would always like to highlight to them is, uh, you know, we, we have our contemporary communities where people get together and form community regardless of where they are, like, especially, I mean, in BC, when I was, um, I was in Vancouver, I was on Vancouver Island, I was away from my quote unquote community, that is Saskatchewan. Um, but we formed community because of who we are and, and how we can connect with one another. And so we have these contemporary communities. 
But there are also still very much alive our historic communities, especially those in like northern Saskatchewan, Pine House, um, and, and Alberta and in Manitoba. You know, we have our, our historic communities too. And and there's such a difference in, in a contemporary community versus a historic community. But there's the similarity of knowing who we are as Métis people and we all belong to the one nation. Um, so I, I think it's absolutely beautiful that there is diversity across the Métis nation while all belonging to one nation. I just think that's it's a beautiful thing. I think there's so much opportunity for us to share our stories and and talk about these similarities and differences. And you know, just by connecting with one another, you say, hey, I had that too, even though we're from two separate communities and you realize that it's because of that common thread of, of being Métis, of our culture, of our history, that collectiveness. And so I just think it's absolutely beautiful. It's amazing. Now, um, one other thing that's beautiful is our different sashes. So mm. there's the, the warrior woman sash, which is gorgeous and purple and raised awareness and money for, for you know, um, you know, a great cause. There's the Terry Fox sash that came out recently, which is great, a great collab between the, the Métis office and the Terry Fox Foundation. Uh, what about you? What, do you have a favorite sash that you wear or do you, do you change up your sash? I change up my sash on the daily. If I could show you my closet right now, I have hangers full of different sashes and all of them have really different meanings. Um, you know, like historically, there are different stories behind the sashes. Like um, if you've seen the Dark Times sash, it's a sash that has, it's predominantly black and it represents the Dark Times that our ancestors went through when they were fighting for our, our inherent right of, of, of being and, and doing and knowing. And, uh, and so there's those tr traditional sashes that have these meanings behind them. And then there are those contemporary sashes that people are, are making, like you say, like the, the sashing our warrior sash, which everything has a different meaning. Um, and then there's also the different meanings of, you know, who gifted me this sash? Who gave me this sash? What was what was happening in my life when somebody gave me this sash or when I picked this sash up? They they tell different stories. And so I am an avid sash collector and I have many different sashes and I could switch them up for days and days and you'd never see me wear a double. But uh, yeah, no, I think, um, again, it's it's all about the stories and, and the relationships that uh, that come come with that. It's amazing. Now, have you got one of the Terry Fox sashes? I did. I was actually so incredibly honored to be sent one of the very first ones. And so MNBC were so generous in, in shipping it. They were on a call like two o'clock in the afternoon one day and they said, oh, we're sending President Karen um, one of the new Terry Fox sashes. And it arrived the next day. It was so quick to arrive. And I was so grateful to have that. Um, I have it in, in my office in Ottawa right now. And uh, I'm, I'm so honored to have one of those. I think they're absolutely stunning. I, I sent one to uh, a fellow you know, Métis brother in Quebec, just outside uh, Montreal there. And he was so excited. I, he was on a call the next time with me on Zoom and he was showing it off. And he was also excited, though, because he was like, this is the same color as the Habs. So oh. I can cheer for my <laughs> Montreal Canadians while being a proud Métis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that incredible. is. I see that for sure. And, you know, I just also love the different stories that our elders and our knowledge keepers tell about sashes, too, and and uh, and all the different ways that our sashes were used historically and getting to hear all of those different stories. Like, you know, you could tie it around your waist so that you don't throw your back out when you're carrying heavy rocks or logs or whatever. You can pull it apart and use the threads individually to mend clothes or to add to your beadwork. Um, and just hearing about all of those different stories as well, they, it connects us to our past, it connects us to our culture and to who we are. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's so important. Again, like there's just a theme in, in everything I say, it's, it's about our stories and, and, and going back to who we are. So you mentioned you have an Ottawa office. I assume you, you've got a home where you are now, and then you head to Ottawa and have to spend some days there. So when you meet with, um, I call it bureaucrats, politicians, uh, folks that are in Ottawa doing the amazing work they do to keep our country running. What do they think about when they learn about the Métis people? Like when you when you communicate to them, when you educate them, what has it been like as far as like 
awareness and understanding and maybe even um, surprises maybe that you've seen. Yeah, when I when I meet with with federal bureaucrats, with ministers, with uh, political people, with like I say, public servants, it's all over the map. And I always operate somewhat under the assumption that they might not know exactly who Métis people are. Um, like I say, previously before I was elected, I did a lot of work in educating people about the Métis Nation, about who Métis people are, what, um, where do we come from, and what is our culture. Um, just that awareness training. And so what I've come to find is that there is a significant misunderstanding and uh, miseducation about who Métis people are and where we come from. Because, you know, um, contrary to, to popular notions, Métis people aren't just a, a European and an Indigenous person blended together and boom, you're Métis. That's, that's not who we are. We we, there was an ethnogenesis of Métis people and we have a shared culture, a shared, um, you know, socio-political background, a music, a language. We make up a nation. And so I do often operate under the assumption that people might not fully understand. And I think I still get really excited and uh, kind of giddy when people are like, yeah, I know all about that. And and it, it makes it easier to to talk to people. But there is, we're still in a period where we do need to be doing that education. We do need to be sharing our stories with not just ourselves, within our communities, within the Métis Nation. We need to share it with uh, with Canadians and the general public um, so that they better understand who Métis people are. And, uh, you know, we, we all have a role to play in, in that education and, and that conversation. And uh, I think that's, that's one that uh, I take very seriously as my role as president. And uh, yeah, and I think... You know, once that awareness is created, we're only going to go even further, right? People are going to know who we are. They're going to recognize us. And uh, and we're going to be able to better work together um, within this country of Canada. It's amazing. I think there's a lot of, uh, yeah, historically, been a lot of lumping. And even today, mm. it's like, well, you're just part of the Indigenous group, you, which, which is part of the BIPOC acronym. Mm. So I'm just going to put you over there. Yeah. And you know that... The acronym of BIPOC, it comes from the States um, and, uh, and it, it did get picked up in Canada. And, you know, I, I, I think that it can cause some harm um, because Indigenous peoples aren't an equity seeking group. We are, we are rights holders. Indigenous peoples are rights holders. We are in the Section 35 of the Constitution. We're not just seeking equity. We're seeking recognition and implementation of our rights. Um, so I think there's absolutely space for us to be working with other marginalized populations and to amplify each other's voices, but to lump us all into one group, I think can actually do some harm. Yeah. I've only ever heard one other person explain that, uh, Tabitha Bull from CCP mm -hmm. is, is not a big fan of that BIPOC mm -hmm. acronym because of that exact purpose. And, and mm -hmm. it's, you, you've both articulated it so well. Thank you. That's so great. So uh, hopes and maybe kind of for the future. You mentioned you've got a lot of hope, which is yeah. so great. Um, maybe help kind of give a bit of like highlights. Maybe it's like, man, this is what the government's done or this is what the Métis Nation you know, National Office has done. Like maybe some like couple little highlights of wins and maybe what's something that you're excited about for the future when it comes to wins. Some W's. Oh, sure. So, I mean... You say I, I have a lot of hope and it's so true. I have so much hope and so much inspiration for the Métis Nation moving forward. Um, so much good has come for the Métis Nation in the past few years. We have made significant strides forward with, like I was talking about, a lot of people are, are coming to understand who Métis people are. That's a significant stride forward. Um, the federal government is recognizing us as a distinct Indigenous peoples, they're, they're working with us on what we call a distinctions-based approach. So they're working with Métis people, they're working with First Nations, and they're working with Inuit, because though we have a lot of common experiences and a lot of, of our, um, our priorities can be worked on together, we do have a lot of uniqueness and, and do need to be worked we need to work with the federal government on that distinctions based approach and the and the federal government has really um, embraced that and because of that 
we've seen a lot of significant investments into the Métis Nation um, in the areas and the priorities that are determined by us. You know, we know our communities. We know what our people need to succeed and to really thrive. And so when we're able to tell the federal government, this is what we need, and for them to reciprocate and to create policies and programs and funding dollars that we can allocate directly to our to our, our Métis governments at the provincial level and to our communities, that's when we see real outcomes for our people. And we've seen that in the past few years. And I can say even just as before I was president, I was seeing that as a Métis citizen. I was seeing the changes that were taking place. Of course, we have so much more to do, especially around, um, you know, the barriers that our people are still facing, like housing and health care and um, mental health, connecting our young people and all of our citizens to the land and to their culture. There's so much more that we can do, but I also see so much more involvement of our people. Our Métis people want to be involved. They're craving that involvement and how they how they can contribute. And that's one thing as president that I am so thrilled to move forward. I recognize that our people are passionate and they have their own unique skills and abilities to contribute to the future of the Métis Nation. And I see my role as a facilitator, how can we create those opportunities for everyone to contribute whatever they want to? And and that's that's nation building. And that's the what that's what we're doing right now. And that's what I'm passionate about. That's what I wake up every single day and think, okay, what are we gonna do today? Who do we get to talk to today? Who do we get to create opportunities for? And and how do we bring more people along? And and like I said at the beginning of this. You know, leadership to me is 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 a collective process. How do we work together for the greater good of our people, of the Métis Nation? And I see my role as somebody who who's just creating these spaces and, and creating the the opportunities for more people to be involved. It's incredible. Uh, I'd say, um, you know, being a member of the BC Nation, the, the amount of education credits that are available. If you want to get training to become you know, advance in your career, to get a job, to open up a career path, Métis Nation supports that, mm-hmm. 100%. It's incredible. I've seen that in offices right across the country, and that's an amazing, I think, win that uh, I think you've been a part of seeing happen for, for our people. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So being in leadership, tell me about your role when it comes to social media. Like, you know, don't want to talk about, you mentioned you have a big heart for young people. So do you feel like you have to be, have a presence on, you know, you know, like you want to be, have a presence at different events and you want to travel again, but do you feel like you have to have a presence on like TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and having to respond to people in all those arenas or what have you done kind of for your availability in that? Yeah. So fascinating. I mean, I'm so glad you asked that question. I was actually reflecting on this just a few days ago and I, I was just thinking back to people who have got the Métis Nation to where they are today and thinking about the different experiences that each of our leaders have um, have gone through. And I thought to myself, you know, like back in the day, like Jim Brady, Harry Daniels, they didn't have social media, but they were still organizing and they were still meeting with people and representing to the best of their abilities. And now here I am as, as the president of the Métis National Council, and I have everything at my fingertips to be able to connect with so many different people. And uh, I won, the first day I was elected, I was like, okay, let's get a strong communications team in. We need to be able to create the pathways to communicate as best as possible the work that we're doing and also open up the pathways for um, our, our citizens through each of our governing members to be heard at, at my level so that I can amplify their voices. And uh, I, you know, through the shuffle of it all, through the transition, uh, we haven't been able to get on TikTok or um, set up our Instagram account. I've been trying to do my own personal social media as best as possible. But, you know, with with the days as busy as they are, I I have to say it's not as much as I want to be doing. Um, But we now have a fantastic team that is surrounding us at at the Métis National Council office who has such amazing ideas about how to 
um, do communications with with our citizens um, in such unique ways. And so uh, a huge shout out to our communications team who are just brand new to the positions, but we're going to be doing some really amazing things coming up in the future. You know, I think I think we are going to be starting a TikTok. We're going to have our, our Instagram, our Facebook, our Twitter and uh, and different ways of of sharing like I say, the stories of the Métis Nation and the work that we're doing at the Métis National Council, it's something that that needs to be done to be transparent, to be accountable to our citizens. And uh, and I look forward to having all of that uh, implemented in the coming months. It's amazing. Cassidy, this has been an honor and a pleasure. I feel like we need to host you again on the show and, and share so much more about um, your experiences and the work you're doing. We have a part two special uh, with our president, Cassidy, who is coming on again, uh, but this time to talk specifically about leadership and youth, because Cassidy, part of your kind of origin story and kind of adventure uh, to the position you're in now, you started originally working with youth, correct? Yes, that is correct. I uh, And I'm still a youth. So I'm, I'm 29 and in our communities, it's 29 or 30, you're still considered a youth. So I still consider myself, I've, I've got about six months left before I quote unquote expire as a youth. But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I love talking about youth leadership. There's so many opportunities uh, for our young people right now. That's amazing. And you, I, I think the government sees youth as under 35. So you've still got another six years with the government. And all of those top 40 under 40 lists, you've still got 11 years to, to apply. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm going to be youthful forever. That's amazing. And then I think someone should and could start a top 40 over 40 list for different areas because I think that'd be Totally. Great. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me about your work that you did with youth um, back in the day. Yeah, so I got involved as a young person, as a community youth representative for my home chartered community, which at the time was the Kootenai South Métis Association. And I, yeah, I what I did in that role was try to meet with youth, Métis youth in my community, bring them out to meetings, bring them out to different events, just find space for young people to gather. And so that was all throughout my high school years. I was a community youth representative. I stayed connected to different Métis youth groups wherever I traveled to in the province. So after I uh, graduated high school, I moved to Vancouver Island for university. And uh, I got connected to the local community at, in Nanaimo. Um, and then at the time I was starting to attend different provincial youth events. And uh, as many of the listeners will know, the Ministry of Youth at Métis Nation British Columbia is absolutely amazing. They are so fantastic at organizing different events and forums and cultural gatherings for Métis youth across the province. So I started going out to those events, became very interested in the role of the provincial youth chairperson and how there was a position specifically on Métis Nation British Columbia's board for a youth voice. And in 2016, uh, there was an election, a provincial wide election. And so I put my name forward um, and I was acclaimed at the time. So I spent four years on Métis Nation, Métis Nation British Columbia's board of directors as the youth chairperson, the minister responsible for youth, and that is, uh, that's how I got involved, was always just through different Métis youth events and opportunities for young people to really um, show their leadership and to, to enter into different positions to be mentored and to flourish as a leader in your community. That's incredible. So I, I need to know that, what was the catalyst that the, the, the that got you just started what what kind of was it an invitation was it someone who invited you what, like what was the impetus to all this i think it was just pure curiosity really i was just curious about different opportunities that existed i had been involved through my family at the community level and just loved going out to the different dinners and events that our communities hosted and when they said there's a youth position available 
And nobody really knew what that meant at the time. And, and I, so I just dove at the opportunity. I was just very curious. And, you know, I think that curiosity um, has really led me to where I am today. And uh, I think what has happened throughout my life, even if I was a little nervous or hesitant, I, I kind of just always said yes. Uh, to different opportunities that came my way, even in university, going to um, different gatherings with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit youth. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know who I was going to meet. I was nervous, but I said yes. And, and those opportunities often led to meeting different people, learning about new opportunities, and just really expanding my worldview and uh, has really, really brought me to where I am today. That's incredible. So in the role that you're in now, as you kind of connect with the different people who run the, you know, again, the youth arm of the different provinces, uh, what's your encouragement to them? Or what, what do you love to tell them about, you know, the role they play and the importance of their role in the Métis community? Yeah, a lot. I have a lot to tell them. <laughs> First of all, I think what's really important for our young people to understand is that leadership is in you. And you don't necessarily have to carry a title to be a leader. You don't have to be elected or appointed in those formal leadership positions to encompass leadership in your communities. We have people, our young people, artists, and you know, we've got young people who are going to school to be doctors and lawyers these days. Everybody within our community is a leader and there's roles for everybody to play. So right now we are, the Métis Nation, in a fantastic position to be doing nation building, to be bringing our communities together. And there is space, no matter what you do or what you want to do, what you're passionate about, there is a role for you to play and you can be and you are leaders in the Métis Nation right now. That's incredible. And, and not to, you know, put you on the spot, but, but to put you on the spot, uh, it's a bit it's a, unusual to have like a, like a national organization, you know, it's, it's federal and covering the you know, sea to shining sea. Uh, and it's run by someone who's you know under 30. And, and so I just want to know, like, why do you think that happened? Because you don't see that in many other organizations. They usually look for people who are, you know, have some scars and, you know, gray hair and, you know, have lived many lives, you know, throughout their the centuries. That's a good question. Um, you know, I think all my life, and, and you still hear it today, you hear that young people are the future. Young people are our future leaders. And all my life, myself, other young people I've worked with, people who have mentored me and supported me have really said, you know, that's that's wrong. Young people are the leaders of now and you have the ability to be heard and your voice matters now. So the whole rhetoric of youth are the leaders of the future, I, I think is quite wrong. And so for me, I just challenged systems <laughs> my whole way up to this position and just really spent my time building relationships, getting to know people across the Métis Nation, um, and and just put myself out there, like I said, just saying yes to different opportunities. And so that's you, and, and you, know, you believed it, you had the fortitude, the courage to do it. How about those that voted you in, those that stood by you and, and, and got you into that position as well? Like, what, what do you think... Is it something within the Métis community where they, they get it? Like there's a, there's a culture within the Métis community that says, yeah, youth are the leaders of today. Because um, again, it wasn't just you, you, know, you could say I'm the best, but it takes convincing others because I don't think you just got the position because of your resume. It was a, a voting process. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there was a lot that contributed to that. Um, you know, also if you just think historically, it has been younger people throughout the Métis Nation who have taken leadership positions. If you even go back to one of our leaders, Louis Riel, he was 24, 25 when he became the president of the, the provisional Métis Council, or yeah, the provisional Métis government. And so he was a young person when he was leading the resistance for our Métis people. So 
and there's there's many others that I that I could name throughout history. Even just our our, our past leaders, they got involved at a very young age. And so, if you really think historically, it has been our young people who have taken these positions. Um, so I think that's that's one of those pieces that contributed to it. You know, I think my vision for the Métis Nation really contributed in 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 gaining um, the, the votes that I needed to become the president. Um, I really articulated a vision that we at the Métis National Council, we can bring back the way that it was supposed to be. What our leaders in the past created the Métis National Council to be, we can bring it back to that to its original state, which was to be the voice the body of of our Métis governments to advocate at the national and international levels. And so it's not necessarily that I have new ideas to bring necessarily to the organization, but I might have new ways to get us to the places where we need to as we evolve. Um, because there, there has been a lot of evolution for the Métis people in, in the, the last few years with the uh, the move towards self-government and and having our inherent right of self-determination, we're almost there to have it recognized and to implement it ourselves. And so it's time that we we have new ideas, new perspectives on how to get to the places that our original leaders wanted us to get to. It's not that I have new ideas of of where we're going. It's just new ideas on how to get there. It's amazing. I love the story you told of university. You would go to these meetings and, and you would connect with First Nations and Inuit um, uh, students as well. So that experience back then in your role now, what's it like now when it comes to meeting with kind of the, the you of the First Nations community in Canada and the you of the Inuit mm -hmm. people of Canada? It's been great. Um, my first week as president, I spent a lot of time crafting... Um, almost an introductory letter to both President Obed and of the, the Inuit Tabri Kanatami, the ITK, and uh, National Chief Roseanne Archibald of the Assembly of First Nations to really introduce myself and to introduce um, my ideas of how, how I see us rekindling relationships between First Nations, Métis, and Inuit across um, this country. Uh, there is a lot of priorities that the three of us work on at the national level that we have similar ideas and we, we face similar challenges and barriers that we can be working together on. Of course, there's a lot of uniqueness uh, between First Nations, Métis and Inuit, and we, we do have to take a distinctions-based approach in a lot of the areas that we work on, but there's also a lot of areas that we can be working on together. And so, um, so I have met with both of them and I do talk to them on a regular basis and, and we are working together um, on, on different areas. And it's, it's great. I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, it's great to see National Chief Roseanne Archibald in a, a position as a woman in leadership as well, an indigenous woman in leadership. She was an inspiration to me to put my name forward. And uh, President Obed is absolutely lovely as well and just so kind and wonderful to work with. It's amazing. I, I could just imagine um, the three of you meeting in, in you know, and, and probably you'll be meeting in person more often in the future, but meeting in a, like a, a beautifully decorated room and like, you know, you know, kind of like a private, you know, kind of, and, and just really getting to see those, um, I think those really powerful visions and hopes for the future uh, discussed and, and kind of planned out. And, and I think the three of you together can really do some amazing work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's... Uh... It was as as a youth in the position that I was at Métis Nation British Columbia. It was something that I heard from from the young people as well. Is that you know we need to be working with with our First Nations and, and Inuit relatives as well, um, and we heard that time and time again as as young people. And so um, really, I mean that that desire to want to rekindle relationships and and work together. Um, comes from from that experience as as a youth at Métis Nation British Columbia. That's incredible. Uh, I want to talk next about being mm -hmm. and and the uh, art of leadership and, and what you can learn from beating when it comes to uh, to leadership. So much. <laughs> so I actually um, 
have spent a lot of time thinking about this. I am a bead worker. I love to bead. I love to look at our traditional Métis beadwork patterns and colors and think about the times when our ancestors were doing this. And, and in that experience and in the experience of learning how to bead, talking with other Métis bead workers across the homeland, I really started to think about beadwork as it relates to both leadership and governance. And I started thinking about all of the different lessons that I'm learning as I sit with this traditional practice that our ancestors had done. And um, I, I, I've had this conversation with a lot of young Métis people. One of my good colleagues and I have actually presented on this a number of different times as well. And um, we've heard across the country that people are starting to learn about leadership through their traditional practices and, and traditional art forms. And so for me, I, for example, would love to share a few of those lessons that, uh, that I've learned from beadwork and, um, and how, how, yeah, how beadwork is related to leadership and governance. Um, one of those be And Cassidy, b before we jump there really quick, do you still have time to do beadwork? Personally, I don't. <laughs> I should. Yeah. No, I absolutely. That uh, that's not an excuse <laughs> at all. Um, I should do better at <laughs> picking up the beadwork. I, even before I was elected and I was doing my masters, I was saying, oh, "I don't have time to bead. I don't have time to bead." And one of one of my my colleagues who spends a lot of time beading and just. Um, really wants to see more bead workers revitalizing and picking up picking up the beads they say well you, all you have to do is spend 20 minutes 20 minutes a day just pick up your beadwork and do it and it's it's such simple uh, it's such a simple ask of me to do and i just haven't done it and and i feel terrible about it but when i do sit down with beadwork actually right before christmas i um, I beaded all of our staff a Christmas ornament, so I did find some time to do some bead work, and and I loved it. It's it's so grounding and uh, really calms me down and and brings me back to my roots. So I should find more time to do some bead work. Thank you, thank you for that. Okay, so lessons learned though from the world of beading and leadership. Yeah. So one of those first lessons that that I've learned from my bead work is that, and you know, we're always told by our elders and leaders that in order to know where we're going as a nation and as leaders, we need to know where we come from. We need to know a little bit about that history, about how our people are a people of resistance and how they've always been fighting for the ways that we want to, our, our rights to um, to live a livelihood that, that we want. And so in order to know where we're going, we need to know where we come from. And I, I learned that a little bit through beadwork as well. I wanted to be able to do beadwork that reflects our, our, our history, our, the ways that our Métis people were doing beadwork, the, flower, the floral beadwork. And so what I've done is I've, I've spent some time in museum archives. Um, in Manitoba, example, for example, I went to the archives and I got to sit with some of our old beadwork and really think about the times that our ancestors were doing this beadwork in the dark by a coal lantern, what was happening at the time, really try to learn from this old style of beadwork and bring it into today. And so the links between our old beadwork and, and our ancestors and where we wanna to go today as a nation is one of those lessons. Another one of these lessons that I've learned is that making a mistake isn't a failure it's a lesson learned. You know, when you're making making mistakes on the beads, like it's a little bumpy, you're pulling your thread too tight, you might have um, put the wrong colors down. You know, you didn't make a mistake. You just, you look at the, the piece of work when you're done and, and start to think about, okay, what could I have done better? Or what would I have done differently? And you learn from that and you move on with, with those lessons. So something that I apply to my leadership, something that I apply to my beadwork. Um, this one I, I, I really love is about how beadwork and leadership, it's really about thinking about 
the big picture. So for me, as the president of the Métis National Council, I'm thinking big picture all the time. Where do we want to go? How are we going to get there? What do we need to do to get there? But that's exactly it, is that knowing that big picture, you have to take a step back and know that you need to take small, incremental steps to get to that finish line. And beadwork has taught me that. I know the big picture of the piece that I, I'm beading, whether it be a, a, a vest or a, a medallion. I know the big picture of what I want to sit down and bead, but you got to get there step by step, bead by bead, and take those incremental steps. So it's about patience, but, uh, but also knowing about, uh, about where you want to go. And it's also knowing when to stop. You know, you can always put more beads down, but do you want to leave a little bit of black space? And I think that's actually really applicable to leadership as well as is, is knowing when to step back and uh, and, you know, maybe let somebody else in. So uh, so that's another lesson. And the last one, I think, for both lead, leadership and beadwork and, and beadwork has taught me this. And when I talk about this, I, I like to share a picture of uh, this baby who I beaded a, a tiny little cummerbund for. Somebody, one of uh, my aunties had asked me, can you bead this uh, for, for my baby? And so when you think about beadwork and you think about those pieces that I was sitting with in, in the museum, somebody beaded that for somebody. It's about creating something that goes beyond myself. And when you think about that and you try to relate it to leadership, that's exactly what I think about too. I'm not doing this position for me. I'm doing this position for our families and our communities and how can we together make a difference. So there's so much that the beads have taught me and uh, that I apply to my leadership style today. And I know that there's many practices of our people, even things like gathering uh, medicines. What can you learn from that experience that you can apply to your everyday uh, leadership styles? And uh, yeah, so so beadwork has taught me a lot. I'm super grateful for those opportunities and uh, need to pick up the beads and see if there's anything more I can learn. Um, as far as beadwork that you own, and that really means a lot to you, can you tell me maybe about a piece or a couple pieces that, that mean a lot to you right now? I think one of my favorite pieces, and this is not to sound anything like this, it's not it's not my best beadwork piece or anything, but it's one that I did myself, but it was the experience of it. I, I actually sat down um, with one of my aunties and, and who is uh, um, an amazing bead worker, and I asked if she could mentor me through the process of beading a cummerbund. And so not necessarily the beadwork piece that I own is my favorite, but the memories that come with making that piece and the experience that I had being mentored by such an amazing Métis woman, amazing Métis auntie, um, are those things that I just absolutely cherish. So I have a cummerbund that I have made for myself. Um, I have beaded in different flowers that represent parts of my life. So I, I beaded a dogwood flower to represent uh, British Columbia. I beaded some wheat to represent my roots in Saskatchewan. Um, and I beaded some rose hips in there because that was one of the first plant medicines that I was taught about. And so different things that mean things to me, um, I beat it onto this piece. And like I say, it was the, the process of beating this piece that has led me to, uh, to make that my favorite beadwork piece. That's amazing. And tell me maybe the, the history. What does it mean to give someone beadwork? And, and what does beading mean to the Métis people? So this is interesting. And I, I've heard a lot of different things about this. Um, even quite recently, I was having this conversation. Um, I have been gifted just in the past uh, few weeks with some beautiful beadwork. And what I was told is that this beadwork is given to me in the role that I am in now because I am out there representing our people and our people are beautiful. And so that was one of the pieces that, that I was taught is that wear this piece to represent who we are, where we come from, and that we are proud 
beautiful people as Métis people and that I am now the face of that and I must represent those values of our communities. So that was one of those lessons that I learned. Another piece though, that is a little more on the sad side is that, you know, historically and traditionally, if you look back at pictures of our, our ancestors, it wasn't, you don't actually see a lot of our people wearing beadwork. And that's because our people were poor and our beadwork was beautiful. And so our people had to sell our beadwork to people with money to make ends meet, to feed our families, to take care of our communities. And so you wouldn't often see a Métis person dressed head to toe in beadwork because we didn't have that wealth or we couldn't keep those pieces for ourselves. Um, so there's a lot of different stories around beadwork and what that means, but um, you know, I do know that now we're doing a lot of work across the Métis Nation. I know so many people who are doing the work of reclaiming these pieces, finding them on eBay or Facebook Marketplace and repatriating these items and bringing them home uh, to where they belong. And, and when I say bringing them home too, those pieces are, are on everything. If, if we were historically wealthy enough to, to keep these pieces, there was beadwork on pillows, on tea cozies, on napkins, on napkin holders, anything that you could bead, our people were beading on. And so, um, so there's a lot of work being done around uh, the repatriation of, of our beaded items these days. And, and I'm so happy to see it, to, to bring these pieces home. So historically, how are beads made back, like back in the day? And then now, if someone's like, man, I want, I'm so inspired by Cassidy, I want to do this. Where do they go to get like their starter Métis bead kit? Yeah, so where beads are made... Like traditionally, they were made over in Europe, uh, Italy. Uh, these glass beads were were being uh, imported by Europeans and trader uh, and traded, and so that's how our people got our hands on, on these these beautiful beads, um, the glass beads specifically, those little tiny seed beads. Um, and uh, you know, today we're still finding uh, different ways to to get our hands on those. Um, uh, those old beads because you can't replicate these colors anymore um, and they're just so stunning so there's different ways to now get your hands on these different beads and it, sometimes it is by uh, finding old old pieces that uh, a, like a, a Victorian style bag in an antique shop and taking it apart for those beads to then be able to do the old style bead work of our Métis people um, and then I also have heard that there are factories in Italy that are closing and they'll, they'll sweep up the beads that might have fallen on the floor. And you can buy the dusty old bags of these beads, clean them up, sort them. Um, so there's still ways to get your hands on these antique beads. Um, but you also absolutely don't need antique beads to do bead work. You can get beads at bead stores all across the country. There's a lot of bead stores who are owned by Indigenous people by Métis people, um, some places online. And, uh, you know, one of the really great initiatives that the youth in Ontario were doing was putting together what they were calling bead kits. And so they are little mason jars with everything that you need to start your first beadwork project. And I believe that the, the youth council in Ontario, the Métis Youth Council, is still making these beads and you can still purchase uh, a bead kit from the MNOYC and that money that they raise goes back into their youth council and to different youth initiatives that take place in Ontario. So it's kind of a, a social enterprise that, that they're running and I think it's just fantastic to be able to give something so accessible to, to young people to learn how to bead amazing hashtag beadwork revolution that's where that began actually yes that is very very cool so i have a uh, six-year-old and an eight-year-old daughter and a three i don't think my three-year-old could do it but my six and eight-year-old i think they're the right age to get started for sure yeah absolutely and i have seen 
younger kids learning with the bigger beads too. So I wouldn't rule three years old out yet. That is very, very cool. So Cassidy, thank you for being here today. Really appreciate it. Talking about leadership, uh, your role as president, what it took to get there, the fortitude, the courage. It's so inspiring, I think, for so many others about what it means to be in a position of power. And I think you walk in in a, a real sense of humility as well, which I think is it, it's so cool. You're so approachable. And, and I think that's allowed for others to see you and, and really hear why you uh, were and are the perfect person to be in the role that you're in now. And, and those lessons you got from beating for leadership, very, very cool. Uh, I'm quite excited to see a uh, written version of this podcast episode and to see even possibly an infographic. That could be a great, beautiful infographic designed up of, of the lessons learned from beating. And I think that will continue to grow. I think you'll continue to see lessons learned in the beating process. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, Kazi, any closing thoughts, remarks uh, that you want to leave our listeners? Always. So many thoughts. Yes, <laughs> so yes, much yes. to say. I mean, my closing remarks would just definitely be out to our Métis young people in British Columbia and across the homeland. Just know that you are loved. You have a role to play. We need you in this process of nation building. Whatever it is you're passionate about, there's a role for you to play within the Métis Nation. And uh, I am so excited to see where we all can go uh, with the Métis Nation in the future. Um, so just uh, st stick with what you're doing, build relationships, get to know one another, and, uh, and dive into different opportunities that, like I say, they might scare you, but... Uh, if, if you're passionate about it, I think just say yes and uh, give it a shot. You never know where you're going to end up. It's incredible. And I think we'll try to put in the show notes um, links directly to volunteer opportunities for youth um, at the different offices across and different regions across the country. Because I think that'd be a great because I think that's the start, right? Is just to put yourself out there and to volunteer. Definitely. Yeah, that's that's definitely one one place to start. It's amazing. And, and yeah, maybe a, an hour a month of advising or on a board or on a you know consultancy thing or kind of being a youth voice could turn into one day becoming the next president of the Métis uh, you know, national headquarters. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Cassie, um, where can people get a hold of you? If they want to follow you online, they want to reach out to you, they want to kind of continue to hear these inspiring stories and, and inspiration, where, where, can you, where, where you spend your days outside of in real life? <laughs> My social media, I have, um, I just have a personal social media account. So I'm on Facebook, just Cassidy Karen. I'm on Instagram. I think it's President Cassidy Karen on there. Those are my personal social media accounts. I'm on Twitter as well. You can follow me there. Um, that's uh, a little bit more of those, those political pieces there. But uh, my personal social media is available. And then also you can always find out what's happening at the Métis National Council through our, our Métis National Council social medias and our website, which is going to be uh, launched, a, a relaunch of our website likely in March or April this year. So lots, lots coming down the pipes. It's very exciting. Cassidy, thanks for joining us. Again. Thanks, Darian. This has been the Métis Speaker Series podcast. I'm Darian Kovacs. Thanks to Métis Nation BC for making this possible with funding provided by the Civil Forfeiture Office's Indigenous Healing Stream. You can listen to all of our episodes, learn more about the podcast, and sign up to the Métis Nation of BC newsletter to stay up to date on Métis news at metispodcastseries.ca. You can find out more about the music we're playing by Love Life by visiting SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash love life official, L-U-V-L-Y-F official, and link in the show notes for your convenience. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast listening device. See you again soon. Mina Kawapa Mitten. Thank you, Marcy, for listening.